Welcome to Can I Park Here, brought to you by findafashiontruck.com. Nashe and Estrell's mission is to inspire future and existing small business owners. They don't claim to be experts. They're simply trying to figure this all out, just like you. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Can I Park Here podcast that you can find on startafashiontruck.com. My name is Nashe, and I'm here with... Australia. Hello. We think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. Um, this is a mobile boutique owner who's actually been in business for two years. Her name is Carissa Strickland. She has a boutique called M2 Boutique Clothier, and she sells contemporary clothing for women and young girls. Um, and what I, uh, you know, she gives a lot of great advice in here and it's great to hear her story. But for those of you out there who have been debating about if Shoptiques is right for you, she really goes into a lot of detail about um, kind of the pros and cons of using it. And as a small business, you know, some of the things that might not work for you. So if you've been on the fence about choosing it to be your online a space like seller or e-commerce kind of website of choice. Um, definitely you want to listen to this episode. Yeah. She gives you the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, also a cool thing is that she used to work for state farm. So she has a little bit of inside knowledge about the insurance game. And she also gives a, a couple tips on that as well in regards to insuring your trucks. So the, the weird kind of, odd thing about it is like it's like just the universe i love it we had just interviewed um shop 10 lizzie the other day i think i i think it was in her intro or outro and i i'm just not sure because we record these try to record these um ahead of time but in some outro i think we asked like has anyone ever worked for an insurance company you know uh so you could come on to the show and then like two days later we're now interviewing her (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> like what are the odds of that um so yeah so she gives some um great tips and some things that you need to ask questions you need to ask your underwriter so to make sure that you are truly insured so when the time comes you're not out of pocket or you know you're not getting sued personally um if something happens but anywho uh let's get to it here we go Hello, Carissa. Welcome to the Can I Park Here podcast. Thanks for coming on with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. It's so weird. I'm in the um, D.C. area and it's actually snowing today. <laughs> and it's like 64 here today and sunny. I you wow. <laughs> I don't miss that weather. I'm originally from New Jersey and you can't get me to move north above the Mason-Dixon line. I, I'm, I don't, you know, <laughs> I'm not jealous of you guys at all. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, snowing it's here so in crazy. Chicago, too. I woke that up this terrible. morning, I had to go to the dentist, and I'm rushing. So I opened the door, I started to run to my car, and I'm like, whoa, it's ice out here. <laughs> It's so crazy. And then for the <laughs> listeners out there, Carissa is um, in Columbia, South, South Carolina. Right, Carissa? Do I have that yes, correct? Yes, okay. Absolutely. Columbia, South Carolina. Capital of South Carolina. Neat. Um, but uh, can you tell the listeners a little bit about you um, kind of uh, before the truck? And then we'll kind of get into where you are now. Sure. Um, before I got the truck, I had an actual brick and mortar storefront. Um, and, uh, well, let me start by saying I am the fiance, the mother of two beautiful boys. <laughs> um, let's see. I have a bachelor's degree in international finance. Um, I graduated from Clark Atlanta university. Um, I have many years of retail experience. I've worked as, um, a manager for Ikea, Macy's and uh, JC Penney. So wow. kind of like retail is ingrained in my system <laughs> that is your jam <laughs> yes is wild. it is yeah. but um what led me to getting the fashion truck was that um I kind of was I guess you can say it was a combination of my creative senses and my frustration um I was kind of frustrated with I mean at the time I was when I first opened up my boutique I was in Atlanta and it was just getting really really saturated with boutiques and you know we were all in close proximity to the uh, apparel mart. So it just 
got really competitive and then we started playing these price war games. So I said, I'm just going to try a smaller market, but not too far away from Atlanta. So that kind of led me to Columbia. But um, the market here is a little different because fashion is not always has not always been the thing here in Columbia. So I guess my frustration with um, just the ability to be able to reach my customers. So I. I just kind of had this thought one day I said to my fiance and I thought he thought I was going to think I thought he thought I was going to think I was like he was thinking I was crazy when I said this. I said, what do you feel about us having a truck and turning it into a boutique? So this way, when we travel and do shows, we don't have to unload. It'll just be really cool. And I thought he was going to look at me like I was crazy. And he just was like, oh, okay. And when I said that to him, I had not done any research on fashion trucks. <laughs> I never even heard of a fashion truck. But when I said that to him, he immediately got on Google and he was like, look, here's this lady. She has a fashion truck and she has a fashion truck. And then we just got hooked. We started YouTubing and watching things. And this was back in like 2011. And so finally, we got the courage to just go out and do it. We bought a truck. My dad helped us with it. I mean, we had friends that helped us with it. We didn't have hire any professionals. It was all like a labor of love sort of deal. Wow. Well, oh. even before we before get we- into uh, the truck, I'm just curious, you know, uh, just listening to kind of your history and your background working at all the different places, what uh, made you decide to really get away from corporate America? Because I think that could be a scary jump for people, like getting into business for themselves because you have like, benefits and you know it's very safe and very comfortable so what made you decide to become like an entrepreneur um well I'll start back when I was a little girl my dad used to own an electronics repair shop so uh, entrepreneurship was always ingrained in me they had um, my mom and dad both had um rental properties income properties so entrepreneurship was always something that I knew I would do. I just never knew what I would be doing. Um, Mm. So when I, you know, worked in corporate America, I, even though it offered me job security, quote unquote, job security, (laughs) (laughs) right? right. (laughs) there was benefits and paid time off and things like that. I just didn't like the culture so much. Um, It was pretty much cutthroat. You know, there wasn't a lot of camaraderie. Um, Because, you know, everybody was trying to make it to the next level of their careers. And you have these corporations that have thousands of employees. And, you know, there's just even though they say, you know, it's a team environment and, you know, we all have to work together to achieve the greater goals. You know, uh, there was a lot of stabbing in the back. And then I just Mm -hmm. didn't like um, the 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 fake flexibility, as I like to call it, you know, when you apply for jobs and they say, oh, the hours are flexible. You can work this hours. This. No, what that really means is we're going to schedule you at any point in time and you can't get holidays off and you can't get, you know, we didn't get Easter off. We didn't get, you know, the day after and the day before Christmas off. I mean, you know, just that I just felt mm. like as an entrepreneur, I had more control over my personal life, over my work life. So that was the big push for me. Wow. And then um and then with the uh the brick and mortar, um how long um did you have that? I just officially closed my brick and mortar store in January. Oh wow. Yeah. Was it hard to let go? It was. <laughs> <laughs> It definitely was. I'm not going to say that I'm going to keep it closed forever, but I feel like right now the fashion truck, well, obviously it's needless to say the margin is a lot greater because you, you take away a lot of the overhead. Um, You know, when I had the brick and mortar, I had to worry about utility bills, phone bills, um, you know, rent, Mm -hmm. you know, just those things got eliminated. So um, I felt like in order to give the truck a fair go and see what it really can do for my business, um, I had to let go of the storefront and and move this forward. But I'm not going to say that I'm never going to open another storefront because I know I am eventually. When you closed the store, did you have to do any kind of liquidation in order to downsize in your inventory or were you able to just move everything over to the truck? I had to do some liquidation, um, but not much. 
Um, I did really what I did was I did a lot of, um, you know, guys, I got this marked down. Come get it. X, Y, Z. Getting ready to close the store. I did some of that. But um, most of it, I was able to transition onto the store, uh, to the truck. And then I also have storage space. So okay. things that didn't sell that were out of season, I just kind of put it in my storage unit um, until that time comes back around. Okay. And what kind of product do you sell? And is it the same product that was in the brick and mortar? Yes, it's the same product. Um, it's young contemporary women's clothing and accessories. Um, you know, just the the current um, fashion statements and pieces that women like to wear. Not too trendy, though, because I like my pieces to be able to transition from, you know, time to time. If it doesn't sell right away, I need to be able to you know, to be able to move it and not mark it down to where I'm taking a loss. So, but it's pretty right. much young contemporary. I have some brands like Sugar Lips, Arc and Co that people are familiar with, you know, those, those sort of brands. Okay. And so when you decided to, you're like, okay, you talk to your fiance, you're like, okay, we're going to do this truck thing. And then you realize like, oh, okay, I need to do some research. Like what did that research consist of? And what were like your first six months? Like what what were the steps that you took? It was a lot of YouTube videos. (laughs) (laughs) Really, I didn't have any other person to lean on locally because there aren't really many other fashion trucks here in Columbia. Um, So, I kind of leaned on the expertise of a friend of mine who does contract contractor work. And um, he's a friend of ours. So he didn't charge us for any labor. And, you know, on his time off, he helped a lot. He helped us with like the main structure of the truck where we were able to then go from there and then put, put our creative touches on it. And my dad, like I said, he was a, he did some electrician work. He was able to install the lights so we didn't have, um, it wasn't too bad as far as trying to get it all figured out. And I should rewind it back. I did some part-time work as a um, closet designer. And oh. so I, yeah, I worked for a closet factory and closets by designs. And I um, I designed closets. So I had the technical side of it, the techno- de- technical design side of it. So I was mm-hmm. able to actually design it. And um, just, again, that experience in retail with planograms and things like that, I had that knowledge. So it probably took about a two months of just the planning part and just figuring out what materials we're going to use. And then at that point, we just we just went in and it took us a while because, you know, materials are, they, you know, adhering the materials to the truck and things like that. It's a lot different. Um, mm-hmm. I do know now going forward things that I would have done differently, but you know, the process was great. It was the last um, project I got to work on with my dad before he passed away. So, I mean, I got some bonding experience with my dad and it was just, I mean, it was a learning experience, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. And what, what are, what are some of the kind of like lessons learned? I think that'll be really helpful because we know a lot of people out there are just starting out and you know, there's, there's, I think, more information out there than there were there was before, like a couple of years ago. But um, anything that you could provide that could help them, like, make better decisions when deciding to, like, you know, furnish their truck or look for insurance or whatever. I'd love to hear, like, your take on it. Oh, well, actually, since we're talking about insurance, <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, insurance is definitely, I used to sell insurance for five and a half years. I sold for State Farm. Um, And that is one of the tricky parts of it because the fashion truck industry is a relatively new industry. So a lot of insurance, that's not a risk that they're willing to take. Um, Mm -hmm. State Farm being one of those companies, they'll insure the vehicle as far as if you get into an accident. Um, But they're not going to insure the business because the customers come onto the truck. And that's that's just something they're not comfortable with dealing with. So I kind of had to get creative and think outside of, you know, of of the box of the traditional insurance companies that everyone knows of. So when I did my research, I researched insurance on like um, party buses 
because their customers are on the vehicle, you know. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know. I and then, think about that, yeah. Right, and then the buses that do the um, transportation for, like, elderly. I started looking in, in those insurance companies, and that was – that that is where I was able to make my breakthrough and find as far as finding intru- uh, insurance. I'm sorry. And then now, if you just type in fashion truck insurance, like companies will pop up now because I guess so many people are looking for insurance now. If you just type that in, it'll pop up. But on the insurance part, I would just say make sure that your underwriter or your insurance provider understands that your customers are being serviced on the truck because there are a lot of people that are insured and they believe that they have coverage for that when in actuality they don't. So if your customer has an injury on the truck and or something like that and your policy isn't written correctly, they will not cover that. So mm. that is very important to, to know and to ask and make sure that your insurance provider understands because it is a new industry. Um, as far as the build out process, I will say whatever you think, if you've got six months in your um, planned in your head for your turnaround time, go ahead and add another four months. <laughs> go ahead and add another four or six months to that because it is so new. You have to be a creative thinker and you have to be a problem solver. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Don't get discouraged. Don't get defeated. Um, People are going to look at you like you're crazy when you walk into Home Depot and you say, this is what I need and this is what I'm doing. They're going to be like, what? Why are you doing what? I don't get it. (laughs) So, you know, don't give up. It is a hard process because, you know, trucks were not made for this. But, Mm -hmm. you know, we're making it for this. And if you've got, you know... um, the the money the finances I would say go ahead and hire a professional. Um, there are companies that focus on modifying vehicles and you know making them all that. And if you've got that money, but if you're like me and you don't have those finances to invest, just make sure you take your time. You ask for help, professional help on the more difficult things, mm-hmm. um, like the electricity and things like that, because the last thing you want to do is die. <laughs> right. In the process of making your truck. <laughs> right. That would be unfortunate. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> but yeah, that's what I would definitely say. Don't get discouraged. Um, because again, this is just a new industry and trucks were not made for this. Um, so I was fortunate to have a lot of help around me. So, you know, lean on other boutique owners. I wish. You know, I was in an area where there were a lot more boutique owners, fashion truck um, owners, but um, I ran, you know, I came across a couple different Facebook communities and that is where now I'm starting to get a lot of my support. So definitely look for support. I wish I would have looked for that support during the process, but definitely look for that support because there are a lot of solutions in those groups. Now, as far as like the interior of the truck, is everything... Uh, the way you want it. Cause I'm like looking at some pictures on Facebook now and I see you have like kind of striped wallpaper up, you have some shelving and then like some of the traditional like hanging styles for clothes. Um, are you happy with that setup? Has it worked as far as like getting people in, allowing them to quickly view your products and find something they like, or is there something that you um, kind of would change now that you've had a couple of years under your belt? Well, let me tell you a couple things about me. I am a person that changes all the time. So when you ask me if there's anything I'm changing, I'm like, absolutely. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to change the wallpaper. I'm going to change. <laughs> That's just the type. I like to refresh things and make it look new. As far mm. as the layout, I would definitely probably use um, different hanging materials as far mm. as the racking system. Um the hanging materials I have now put more of the support in on the wall. Um, once I go back and redo the hanging and the railing system, I'm going to make more of the support from um, use a more floor based support system because this way the weight is on the floor where gravity pulls as opposed to being on the wall. Um, because I've had issues with the ra- the racking. Um, 
coming off of the wall and then I have to reattach it. And once again, because, you know, this is a truck and not a traditional home, um, it's harder to use certain screws. Um, so yeah, I would definitely use a different rail system. I would probably use a floor based system as opposed to a wall based system. Definitely need shelving. Um, I do want to incorporate probably some more mirrors. I do have a mirror in my fitting area, but I probably would incorporate some more mirrors because mirrors make the space look bigger. Anything to make the space feel wider. Although there is, you know, a lot of space in the truck because it was a delivery van, a universe delivery van. But, um, yeah, I would definitely incorporate things that make it feel larger. But as far as aesthetics, design-wise, that's probably going to be something that I change often. Just That's just the nature of who I am. I want to kind of um, backtrack a little bit um, to the truck. How long did it take you to find your truck and where did you end up finding it? And how much did it cost you? <laughs> okay, so... I, it took a while because I was going online doing a lot of searches. Um, I did I did a search. I was looking at the U-Haul trucks, the used U-Haul trucks that they sell once they upgrade to newer models. Um, I looked at um, trucks that were in other states. I mean, the search process probably took like three or four months. And um, I was on my way into State Farm office one morning. And I saw a truck for sale. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> it's a truck right there for sale. And it was a step van. It was a Unifirst uniform truck. And I was like, wow. So um, I walked inside and the guy was like, oh, we just sold it. But I have another one in the back. And I was like, all right, well, let me check that one out. And um, the guy that was selling it, he actually has a contract with Unifirst, um, you know, the uniform company, and he repairs their trucks. So whenever they upgrade, they give him an option to buy their old trucks. And so he'll buy the old trucks because he does all the maintenance on the trucks. So he knows the conditions of them, the condition of the trucks. And so and then he'll sell them. So he just happened to have a few step vans that he was trying to sell. And I bought one of them and mine was only forty five hundred dollars. Oh, nice. I love to hear great deals on trucks. <laughs> yes, I was definitely fortunate. I mean, it was just like God said, I was just driving and there it was like a block away from the State Farm office. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, so with because um, you were working at State Farm at the time and then did you still have like your brick and mortar at the time? Too. Sure did. Um, and, the State Farm job was pretty flexible because um, it was sales based. So, uh, I, you know, okay. I was able to do that and have my boutique at the same time. So, yeah, I did both at the same time. And then did you do like when you opened a truck, did you still so you were doing like then all three or did you say like, OK, I'm just going to focus on the brick and mortar and then the truck? I did eventually wind up, I left State Farm last year. I was doing all three at one point. Um, wow. And then I, right. That's, I've worked two, three jobs since the time I was legal, of legal age to work. So. <laughs> right, Michelle, I don't know why you're saying like, wow, like you are not doing the same thing right now. Okay, <laughs> that is true. But, but to me, like, yeah, I have like a full time job and I have like stuff that I do like on nights and weekends. But then most of the stuff I do on nights and weekends is like online based, which makes it easier. Yeah. But I guess when I think of like a brick and mortar, if it's open mm-hmm. later in the day and on weekends, you know, like that's like more mm-hmm. uh, labor intensive. Yes, it is. Um, and you definitely have to use a lot of the support from your family and friends around you. I did have some um, part-time employees, interns that worked in the store. So the store was always staffed. Um, my fiance worked in the store when he didn't have to work. And fortunately, his his work um, schedule allowed him to be off during the time that the store, with the brick and mortar store was open. And um, with the fashion truck, because the way the ordinances are set up in South Carolina, we just can't like park on the street 
and just start selling. So most of my use of the fashion truck have been at pre-planned events. So I was always able to coordinate my schedule around these around events. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I did all three, but right now I'm just doing just the fashion truck. I'm not doing anything else at this point in time except the fashion truck. Wow. I mean, that's kind of like exciting because I feel like a question that we get a lot is like, uh, can I sustain myself just with the fashion truck? Like, will it bring in enough revenue to pay the bills, you know, utility, mortgage and or rent and you, you still be able to like enjoy life? Um, and I feel like some people have been able to do that successfully and where as some people still need kind of like the regular nine to five to supplement the income to still make it work. Um, so it's always cool and interesting to hear stories where people um, have been able to like make it work and be able to like focus full time on doing it. I definitely um, it is definitely a challenge and it was something that, you know, I still struggle with as far as am I comfortable with just solely depending on this fashion truck. Now, I will say that I still have an online presence and that Mm -hmm. has been very helpful as well. I still ship out things online, but yeah, it's definitely, you know, a, a, a hard transition, especially when you're used to, you know, that consistent paycheck, you know, every two weeks or every week you're going to get paid. You know, and so now it's just like you have to put in all of the work to get paid. But I always <laughs> remind myself, right, I always remind myself if I can put in eight, 10 hours a day for someone else, for another company, for someone else to become profitable and wealthy, I should be able to do that for myself as well. Mm-hmm. So it's about commitment. You have to commit. You can't be afraid. Um, of course, it's scary, but you just can't be so afraid that you just freeze up and it just inhibits you from moving forward it's a scary step it definitely is i'm not gonna lie to anybody and say that you know oh it's easy go ahead and do it i mean you have to learn you have to overcome all the obstacles that are in front of you because again it is a new industry and but you have to be if this is something that you that you said you're gonna do then i would think you already have the basis of that commitment level that it takes if you said that you're gonna get a fashion truck and you go out and you buy the truck and you've done it to me you've already you already have what it takes because just the truck itself is a is a hard process mm-hmm. so if you've already committed that far then you might as well just go all the way <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Now, um, with your products, I know that um, you you offer uh, contemporary clothing for women and young ladies. Now, in addition to that, you offer actual services, too. So can you tell me a little bit um, about the Prime Concierge? Yes. Prime Concierge is something I came up with. Um, I know a lot of women that, you know, their daughters are ready for prom and they're overwhelmed and they're like, oh my gosh, can't wait for this to be over and we can't find the right dress. And I was already helping like some moms find dresses for their daughters. I was already doing that. So I said, wouldn't it be great to just kind of make this an offering, even though we don't carry formal gowns, Mm -hmm. to make this an offering for our customers? Because you know, a lot of times I would come upon people and they'd be like, I wish I knew that you did this because if had I known that you did this, I would have reached out to you to help me prepare. And we already have relationships. Um, a good friend of our of ours owns a transportation company. So I was like, I could really just kind of take this whole process over for parents and just make it completely easy for them. So that's how mm-hmm. I came up with the prom concierge. And what we do is we, we help moms select dresses that, you know, based on what they want. And of course you have to consider what the teenager wants and what the mom wants. And <laughs> we help them find the dresses within their budget. Um, and we book the transportation for them, you know, if they want a limo or if they want a party bus or something like that. Uh, we just handle all the the makeup and the hair. We handle all of that for them. We coordinate all of it for the, the mom and um, yeah, we just we just take the headache out of it. <laughs> okay. Wow. And then also, I wanted to ask you, like earlier, you said, of course, that you sell online, which I think is great because I I feel like if 
Um, you are doing it full time. Like you, we just finished talking to Shop Ten Liz- Lizzie about that. Like you need like multiple streams of revenue coming in. Um, but uh, I noticed that you use Shop Teaks, and in our private Facebook group, I feel like there are two camps: the people who love Shop Teaks and the people who hate Shop Teaks. Mm. Um, so, so um, have you found them to be like easy to work with? Um, have you? done well like using their services to like sell your items this is what i'll say about shop seats they're great as far as getting you the exposure however Mm -hmm. i don't think that from a logistic or a business side for smaller business i think they have a lot of things that they need to work out um Mm -hmm. For example, like the return policy to me is not suitable for small businesses. And when I was approached by Shoptiques, I was told that, you know, they're here for small businesses and they're here to benefit and, you know, improve upon and, you know, pretty much make it so that we can reach other um, markets. But uh, also they have, you know, things that they do to me that kind of is inhibit inhibiting. For example, if you are a small business owner or boutique that uses drop shipping, they make it extremely difficult for you to be able to drop ship to Mm -hmm. maintain those drop ship relationships. Um, Also, if you are, um, for example, if you use images or the product images that are provided from your um, wholesaler on your website, well, they have really, really, really strict photo or image guidelines. And so it makes it a lot more difficult for you to upload your pictures onto the website. Another thing that I found challenging, and also I'll, I'll run back as far as the images. They do tell you that they'll take pictures for you, but you have to have at least, I believe it was something like 20 of the item in stock before they'll take the pictures for you. Now, as a small boutique, who carries 20 of the same item? Right. Like, we, we just don't do that. And our our... Customers don't expect that from us. They're not coming to get things that everyone carries. They're coming to find unique things that not only a lot of people have. So it's even challenging carrying six of an item because if, if they feel like there's a possibility that they may bump into somebody wearing the same thing, that you know kind of takes away from the sell. So definitely I'm not going to carry 20 of the same item. So that's another thing that's you know, there are just a lot of things that I feel like don't make the process easy. So um, I actually am going to transition away from Shoptiques this year. Oh, and what are you thinking about switching to? Um, I'm probably just going to switch back to my standard platform. I think I was using Shopify prior to this. I'm going to do a little bit more research um, on, on some other um Post sites, but oh yeah, and then another thing is they don't with shop teeks. I'm sorry, they don't differentiate what is in one boutique versus another. For example, um, I had a customer who was searching on my site and not realizing that it was um, serviced by shop teak, if you will, if they that they facilitated the sale. She went into a search engine for 49 and under and it brought her to someone else's page so she thought she was shopping with me but uh, she's shopping with someone else so uh, right and that's just another thing with shotties and then they have their feeds that they charge and the turnaround time on getting your money from a cell is extremely long so um i wouldn't say that they they um they're not as friendly to small business as they make it seem. Um, they have to work out those kinks. They really have to. If they're going to target the small business community, they've got to work out those kinks. Yeah. And then, you know, I would say for for the listeners out there who are kind of considering, like, what to use, I mean, I feel like, you know, the easiest and the most economical is, of course, Etsy maybe when you're first starting out, right. you know. Um, and then Oh, Nishay. If- I'm sorry to cut you off, but do you know that Etsy now has um, the, you have uh, a way to make your own website through Etsy? It's called Etsy Patterns. I saw that. Yes. So you can actually like through your shop, you can click to Etsy Patterns and it'll actually like 
merge your existing listings and you can build your own website and design it yourself. Wow. And I, yeah. And now, I, I didn't there look might be in a small it. small fee, right? Right. I didn't look in it that far to see what the charge is, but it is still cool though that you don't yeah. have to do any like extra work. You can just use your existing listings and transform them. Right. And you know what? That's the thing with most of the sites when you're talking about an e-commerce page, there is going to be some sort of small fee associated with it, especially when you're talking about credit card processing and hosting. You should expect to to pay a a fee. Um, I've used Wix. I've used Weebly. I've used Shopify. Shopify is very easy. However, I am going to explore the idea of a Wix or a Weebly site only because I like the template based um, website where um, I like a lot of their their templates. They're really modern and funky and they're really easy to use. But I will look into Etsy as well. But I'm definitely going to transition away from shop seats probably by the middle of this year. Yeah. And then, yeah, for the listeners out there, I would say like, um, you know, my tops, you know, because I'm total designer and web designer. But it would be like Etsy is the easiest. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Estra, because of the patterns. I saw that, too. And it seems like they're going to have like some very cool and modern templates. But then I would say Shopify. Shopify is a little bit more expensive. So yeah, it you is. might not want to start off with it because you're going to kind of come out of pocket maybe a couple hundred for that first year, you know. And there mm-hmm. might be a little bit of a learning curve, but you could go on to YouTube. And, and they are actually really helpful. And then you have Squarespace, too. Yeah. And they're mm-hmm. pretty cool. And they have a commerce section. And then if you're really adventurous, it takes more work. Tech-wise, um, I would suggest WordPress. You have to do oh, a little yeah, bit more WordPress. work or you might have to right, hire a web designer or a developer, just depending. But um, those are like kind of my top four. The only one that I haven't really used is Squarespace, but... I've seen so many good Squarespace that I feel comfortable enough, like, recommending Yes, I've them. seen a lot of really nice Squarespace. And um, I played around with it a little bit, and they're really easy. They're really easy to use. Yeah, it's, but it, it kind of comes down to, like, I feel like you have to figure out, one, if the fees make sense for you. And two, Correct. when you look at all those design templates, like... Your does your style, your aesthetic, the photos that you have, the message that your your brand, you know, that you want people um, to identify with, like, do they have like the templates that make sense for that brand or your brand? Right. Like, no. Yeah. And I'll mm. also I'll say this, and my last thing I'm going to say about Shatiks, I promise. Um, <laughs> When you submit, because they have to approve the items that you submit to sell, it takes them two or three days to approve an item that you post. So if you if something came in stock and you're like, great, I'm going to get this up, I'm going to sell it, and you upload it, and you're like waiting two or three days to find out if the picture is acceptable or if it's not acceptable, it's just like, why do I have to wait two or three days to start mm-hmm. selling this? It's in stock. Every day counts for me. I'm a small business. I want to be able to just upload it and publish it, and I can just start selling it. Yeah. And you know what that made me think of, too? And I, I'm not sure. I'm not that familiar with ShopTeague, so you can let me know if I'm wrong about this. But unlike, let's say, Etsy or let's say Shopify or you know some of the plugins you could use with WordPress like WooCommerce, you there isn't an app so if you sell something in shop teaks right like you could potentially also sell it on a truck at the same time at the same time right Correct. It, because you're not using the same database to pull from right and that happened to me and you will get penalized if you yeah, don't yeah. make that sell for shop teaks even though nobody got the money i never got the money or shop teaks all they have to do is return that person's money um they won't even offer like the customer something different. Like, for example, I had something that I sold that was similar to the what the person purchased, but I sold it on the truck, like almost at the same time that someone bought it online. So I didn't have an opportunity to take it offline because, like he said, it's not streamlined. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that happened to me. And um, they penalize you for that. They charge you a, a penalty um, because they said it's a bad customer um, service experience. But meanwhile, they wouldn't even offer the customer the similar style. So, 
It was like, I was like, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. She was like, her her response was that, well, if they had wanted that style, they would have purchased it. I said, well, I didn't have it available for them to purchase on the website. But I do have images for for them if they want to look at it and see if they, you know, if they want it. You know, trying to save the style. Um, And they just didn't want to do that. And I'm like, but this is a practice that small businesses do. Like, if we don't have something, or not just small businesses, large businesses, if someone comes in and they're looking for a particular style, you may not have that specific item, but you try to sell them something else. So I just didn't understand why, if they're so, if they go to bat for the small business, why wouldn't she offer that to them? Um, And and it just seems like they were more interested in getting the money off the penalty. And for the listeners out there who aren't as familiar, this is their first time with retail. An example is like with Shopify or Etsy, like let's say if you list something on Shopify, like you list like a dress and that you have two of them, you're in the truck, you have the two of those dresses also in the truck. If someone buys it in the truck, you could go on the app and well, when you when they make that purchase, it automatically will take one of the dresses off the website. Like it'll automatically Correct. move it down to one or vice versa. If somebody buys it online, you'll get a notification. Someone just bought it. So you can immediately take it off the rack and then put it somewhere else. So someone doesn't accidentally buy it while you're at an event. Like you could save it so you can mail it out later since someone has purchased it online. So really thinking about how you're going to manage that inventory. If you sell on both the truck and online, I think it's key. Mm-hmm. But this, I think you're, but I'm so glad like that we found out more about the shop teaks because this is, I feel like that question with Astra has come up like two, three times in the group. So I think this will really um, kind of bring light to like some of the issues that uh, people may have to deal with if they do decide to go the shop teaks route from someone who's been using it for a while. Mm-hmm. So thank yeah, you for that. Yeah, it for a while. <laughs> Also, so do you also do a private parties in like yes, events? Yes, I do. Yes, oh, I do. Um, okay. I'm actually fine tuning um, the way I want to do those because it can be costly to go to a party and then nobody buys anything and <laughs> you have those sort of situations. So I'm trying to fine tune the policy on private pop, uh, parties, but yes, I do do them. If people call and they say they want to do a shopping party, you know, I offer incentives to the host um, for the, you know, for the purchases of her guests. Um, but yeah, I, I want to work on that and fine tune it a little bit more. I don't want to make it so that people are discouraged from booking parties, but um, I just have to find a balance to make it worth my while and worth their while. And then before we kind of go into like our like wrap up questions, I'm just curious. So now that you've had the the boot um, the mobile boutique for two years, like, um, do you have any advice for the future mobile boutique owners who are like just starting out? They really want to do it, but just any advice you have for them um, to get them started or motivated or even giving them a reality check. Yeah. One, um, don't do it if this is not really something that you want to do. If you, mm. it just looks cute and you saw somebody <laughs> else do it and you want to try it, don't do it. Um, do it because this is something that you really, really, really feel passionate about. If you like to travel, but you like to make money while you travel, and you like to go to different festivals, then this is something that you can do. If you're tired of, because you have people who are already vending and going from event to event to event and then having to set up, break down, set up, break down. And if you're tired of that, I would definitely say this is a great option. Um, when you're at doing outdoor festivals and it starts to rain or the wind is really bad, you always have that shelter of a truck. So that is the plus side of it. Um, I, another thing I tell people is that if I were to do it again, I would probably um, get a travel trailer. Or uh, something of that sort, because the travel trailers are already suited to be built upon. They're already they already have the base materials, so transitioning them is not as um, hard as it is transitioning just a, a steel metal or metal truck. Um, so and those are two. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What's a travel trailer? Is it like where it's like one of those you know, large like, oh, trailers that you're? It's kind of like hitched to the back. 
versus yeah or the ones okay. that are like a winnebago or you know ah, just a, okay. an rv a recreational vehicle and you okay. can get used ones you know i wouldn't say go out and get a brand new one <laughs> get a used yeah. one one that you you know that's self-propelled one that you can drive or one that you can pull if you have you know a vehicle that can pull like some people have f-150s or you know pickup trucks or whatever you can pull a travel trailer. But if I had to do it again, I would definitely get a travel trailer thinking in hindsight, I would have done that. Hmm. Interesting. They're already tall enough. They meet the height requirements for people to stand in because people are already standing in them already. So, I mean, like I said, because they're already, they already have the base materials where you can build onto. um, To me, that's probably the best option as far as converting them you know your floors are already down <laughs> oh true i didn't even think about yeah that. you know there's already you know wood structuring and things like that the base is there so all you have to do is get creative i mean they even have bathrooms so oh right that is true <laughs> so if you're taking a long distance trip which is what i like to do you know they're already suited for that they're already made for that so you just got to get creative as far as the design and Definitely get the help of a professional. Get, I mean, if 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 necessary, if you don't have to, because you're trying to save money. Um, and then also another thing that I'm um, actually transitioning to is now solar power, so that I don't have to use a generator. Oh. It seems like yeah, I've, it's like solar power is like. Um, I don't feel, I feel like getting more popular. Even we had like a couple of different companies come around the house and uh, trying to get us, you know, to get the, the panels on the roof. Um, so now yeah. that's all, it's like a more, well, it can be kind of more economical. Uh, well, I actually to went it, to the um, RV store and because um, I watched a few YouTube videos, of course, back on YouTube. That's all I do. Watch YouTube tutorials. And I watched um, a guy who powered his camper, his travel trailer, because he used his to camp um, with solar panels. And um, he was running like air conditioning and refrigerators and dishwasher. He was running like the full scale on his, you know, solar panel. And I'm like, wow, all I need mine for is lights. So I would be, you know, it's, it's quieter. It's not as heavy as a generator. Generators are extremely heavy and mm-hmm. cumbersome. And also, I'm saving money on the gas that I would have to power, use to power my generator. So, and then it stores, like, the, the storage time on your, or the lifetime of the amount of energy you get to use, it, to me, is a lot longer than a generator. A generator, you know, sometimes you get four hours out of it, and that's before you have to fill it back up. Whereas the solar lasts a lot longer, so if, you, if you're not a you know afraid, there's really no reason to be afraid. But if you <laughs> you're looking to <laughs> if you're looking to you know extend your power, um, definitely look into solar. I think that should be the new wave of doing it because I don't like to have my truck. I know a lot of people idle too. I don't ha- like to have my truck turned on when I'm parked. I like mm-hmm. to be able to turn it off and. The generator was the first thought, but um, after watching a few YouTube videos, um, and then also someone stealing my generator, I decided to just go the solar oh. route. <laughs> well, yeah. Dang, that sucks. I know it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just a few wrap-up questions just to help the audience get to know you a little bit better. Um, do you have a favorite podcast, blog, book, or TV show? And if so, what is it? Oh, Lord. My favorite TV show nowadays is Underground. (laughs) And um, I don't really listen to many podcasts. I have to get into that. And I like sci-fi books. So (laughs) I've been reading like the fifth wave and things like that. I I read all the sci-fi books. So um, that's what I was reading. That's what I just finished reading was the fifth wave. I've got to get into more... um, business books um but i'm i'm like really imaginative and i love science fiction but oh, the, um goodness. underground is definitely my favorite show these days other than reality tv <laughs> <laughs> the addiction um if you could have 
any celebrity, entertainer, model, athlete, whoever visits your mobile boutique, who would it be? Mm. Wow. Let's see. Celebrity wise to visit my boutique. I don't know, maybe Jennifer Anderson, because I like her fashion sense. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I love I I really like the way she dresses. Um yeah, so maybe Jennifer Anderson. I like Jennifer mm. Anderson. Yeah, she's her style is very clean. I can see her wearing your clothes. Um, what do you like to do in your free time just to like wind down and de stress? Oh, I love to sit on my patio. Drink a glass of wine, <laughs> read in style, glamour, any fashion magazine there is. That helps me unwind. I keep the kids in the house or maybe I drop them off at their grandmoms. Or I walk I go across the street and I walk around the lake. But that's what I do to decompress. Ooh, sounds lovely. I wish I had a lake. <laughs> uh Android or iPhone and what's your favorite app? Okay, so I am an Android Galaxy girl. Um, mm. Specifically Galaxy. It has to be like Samsung Galaxy, <laughs> not just any Android. It has to be Samsung Galaxy. <laughs> and right now, my favorite app, other than my Starbucks app <laughs> <laughs> and my Panera app, I like to eat and drink coffee. Nice. I'm, I'm really in, I'm, you know, I'm really into Instagram. I really, really, really dig Instagram. Um, yeah. I just like the visual side of it. I love the, to me, it's easier to connect to people. I like Twitter for the purpose of live tweeting. Otherwise, I'm not really on Twitter because I feel like everything gets lost in mm. the, the feed. And then most recently, I'm getting into Periscope. Oh, neat. Yeah, I love Periscope. Can yeah, I it's like it? TV for me. Yeah, Astro, she she refuses to bite. She's not a real a Twitter person anyway, and so nope. but you, <laughs> but the live tweeting is cool. So if if someone like is like, okay, we're gonna have like a Twitter party at twelve o'clock and talk about X, I think that's what Twitter is great for, like having those Twitter like quick great conversations. For that. Whenever I'm watching, yeah. yeah, whenever I'm watching quote unquote ratchet TV or reality TV. I'm always on Twitter live tweeting because that is like my comic relief. That is like some of the funniest things I read ever in life. But Periscope to me, I'm just amazed at the ability to just watch other people's point of view and perspective from anywhere on the globe. Yeah. I mean, live. I watched, yeah. Yes. I watched a, a live car chase in California on Periscope. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about reality TV. Like, that is truly Correct. reality TV. I mean, it's like <laughs> happening at the moment. Yeah, that is true. Okay, our final question is, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Oh, wow. What would I say? I'd probably be a singer. <laughs> oh, nice. Or an actress. <laughs> Neat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you get to like probably, I'm assuming like travel and, you know, meet all kinds of cool people. And start all the businesses that I want to start because I'm sort of like a serial entrepreneur. I always come up with new business ideas and I always try to put them into action. But money, you know, can't be spread in so many different ways. So I think, and then I like to give back. I like to do a lot of community fundraising and sort of events. So if I could do something and not fail, I would say being an entertainer because then you get the money to be able to support the other things that you want to do in life. Um, and where can the audience find you? If you could just let them know what your website is and any social media handles you'd like them to have, please share. Sure. Um, my website is M like Mary, the number two boutique.com. So that's M two boutique.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash Boutique M2. Had to do it the other way around because M2 Boutique was already taken. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing, right? Same thing with Twitter. Um, boutique M2. Um, and then on Instagram, it's M2 Boutique Clothier. Um, yeah, and that's, that's really what I'm on. Um, Periscope, you can use the same Twitter handle, Boutique M2. Um, but my personal page on both Twitter 
and um, Instagram is Cloology. C L O O L O G Y. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Well, thank you so much um, for coming on the show. I think it'll be really helpful for people, especially the shop teak stuff, because I can't tell you how many times that has come up before, but all the other stuff too that you've um, mentioned. So thanks again. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. Great episode with Carissa. And you know, um, her, the her last comments made me think of something um she mentioned how like she ended up having to like switch around her social media handles uh when she got to facebook she couldn't do m2 boutique she had to do boutique m2 so i would just say because we kind of ran into the same issue too um as you're coming up with a name for your business once you've gotten a name Try to get the same social media handles, if possible, with everything. Like, even if you know that maybe it's going to be a year out before you start, doesn't matter. Go ahead and lock down all the same social media handles on Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, um, Snapchat, you know, Pinterest, every social media site out there. Even if you don't even think you're going to use it, go ahead and... um make sure that you have secured the handle. And when I say handle, it's the name you want. Like for us, it's FFT underscore official underscore. But in some places, unfortunately, you'll just see find a fashion truck. Um, but we couldn't get it in all of them. But, uh, but that's what I mean by handle, like the name you decide to use on these various social media accounts. So just something to keep in mind. But you know, sometimes it, it's still like it's inevitable for businesses to to not be able to get the same name across the board, because even like existing businesses from back in the day, you know, they started, you know, five, 10 years ago, Instagram wasn't really out. So by the time they go to sign up or whatever, the name's taken. So they have to use something else that's not even right. close to what their name is. So it's like five years from now, there's going to be something else new that everybody's using. Absolutely. So. It's just crazy. So, but the idea is to keep the same name across the board. And if, if you possible. can't get, right, if possible. And if you can't try to get it as close to the true name as you can. And it really helps out too, because like, let's say even us, like if we post something on Instagram and then have it auto shared on Facebook, which then auto shares it with Twitter, if all the handles are the same, it like links back really nice. Um, so just something food for thought that, that when she said that, it just made me, um, think about that tip. Uh, but this was, I feel like a great episode. And then for websites too, you know, of course she talked about shop teaks. Um, and from what I've read in the Facebook group and, um, hopefully no one from shop teaks is listening, but if they are, maybe it'll have them rethink some of their policies. But from what she said and what I've read in the Facebook group, I say go with one of the four we discussed earlier. Go with either Etsy, Shopify, WordPress, or um, what am I missing? Squarespace. That's what, just me personally, those are the four that I say consider, like experiment with. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode. There was a a lot of great knowledge in there. So what we need you to do now is go to iTunes and leave us an awesome review and an awesome rating. When you're done with that, you can go (laughs) and check us out on social media. We are FFT underscore official underscore at Twitter and on Instagram. And on Facebook, you can find us as Find a Fashion Truck. Yeah. And, um, you know, for more, uh, for all the show notes and uh, more episodes, just go to startafashiontruck.com and you'll find everything you'll need. And please, you know, feel feel free to comment. We love getting comments under the show notes too. If you have any questions, if you want any clarifications, or if you have any ideas. Um, and also on Start a Fashion Truck, if you go to the podcast page or the contact page, you can leave us a voicemail message. You could leave tips. You could ask questions or whatever. And of course, we'll air it on the show and uh, try our best to like answer it if it's a question. Um, but if it's tips, you know, we love sharing tips from um, all of you guys. 
But anywho, uh, thanks again for tuning in. We appreciate you taking an hour out of your life to listen to us. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful day or night. All right. Thanks for parking here. Bye.